The roar of the lawnmower and trimmer running simultaneously rudely disrupted my Saturday morning nap. A groan from the other side of the bed showed that I wasn't the only one annoyed. Darla sat up and swung her legs off the bed. She sort of stretched and yawned at the same time. I'm sorry, Brian, I completely forgot. The boys wanted to get an early start on the yard work so everything would be ready for tonight. Heading into the bathroom, she shook out her blonde hair. Her ass jiggled defiantly under her thin cotton nightgown. After 20 years, she still looked good. Today was my birthday. It was a tradition to have a barbecue and invite the whole world. Well, it wasn't that bad. Just family, friends, and neighbors. For a birthday party, it was a little too much. We had to borrow some grills and smokers to handle everything. Even when I thought it was my day, I always felt obligated to cook most of it. I wasn't very good at it, but it turned out as expected. The best part about it was that the cook always had a cold beer in his left hand. I had to keep my right hand free to cook the meat. Do you want your birthday present now, or do you want to wait until tonight? The shower is warm and ready. Darla smiled, peering out from behind the bathroom door. Her nightgown was gone, and she was playing coy. I'll see you tonight, little lady. Right now I'm going to go down and help the boys. I'll shower later. Todd was 18 and due to leave for the University of Texas in two months. Terry was a year younger and already had a scholarship to Auburn. They were good sons, and I gave Darla credit for raising them right. Perhaps the only thing I gave them directly was a comfortable home and a good work ethic. I always regretted not being a better, more involved father. We spent a couple hours tilling the yard and patio pretty thoroughly, and then fired up some grills. I wanted to cook the ribs for smoking first. Hamburgers, hot dogs, and steaks could be cooked as needed, but the ribs needed to be pampered. Todd started the smoker while Terry spread dry mashed potatoes all over the meat. Hell, the way things were going, I could probably sit back and let them take care of everything this year. Darla arrived just as we finished all of our prep work. Her two sisters had to come over to help her with everything she needed. We had over 50 people to feed today. It's funny how friends come when there is free food. I was 40 years old, but I still felt 20. And next month, Darla and I would celebrate our 20th wedding anniversary. It had been a good marriage. The sex wasn't as hot as it had been in previous years, but it was still great. It seemed to stop about a year ago, shortly after Darla started working. Fear of an empty nest pushed her out of the house. I was happy if she was happy. We didn't need money, but she needed companionship. The boys and I headed for the showers. I had a new shirt, especially for such an occasion that my mom had brought over earlier in the week. It wasn't exactly my style, but I was obligated to wear it. I looked like a Hawaiian pimp. Darla wisely insisted I wear an apron. Sure enough, I had a nice apron that said, don't kiss the chef. It wasn't long before our guests began to arrive. Some brought platters of food, some brought gifts, and some brought drinks. The weather was beautiful, and the day promised to be lovely. Darla looked gorgeous and, as usual, was the perfect hostess. She would be 40 next year, but she had no problem passing for 30. She maintained her figure and looks. I looked forward to a few exotic weekends and vacations after the boys left. I watched her flitting between tables, making sure everything was perfect. The perfect wife and the perfect mother. What more could a man want? Finally, the excited crowd began to eat. Plates of food suddenly appeared and disappeared all over the courtyard. Most of the guests had brought their own garden furniture, which made it easier. Beer was in one trough and sodas in another. I knew the cake was safely in the kitchen, waiting for its hour of glory. I don't know where he came from, and I certainly didn't recognize him. He was tall and wearing a dark blue jacket. He stopped at the edge of the party pad, leaned over and said something to one of the neighbors. She pointed to Darla. He thanked her and walked in our direction. Darla noticed him approaching and seemed to feel a little awkward. I didn't say anything as he walked past me. Darla Connors? My wife nodded and said, yes. He handed her an envelope that he pulled from the inside pocket of his jacket. Darla Connors, you have been served, that will be all. He turned and left as quietly as he had appeared. No, of course, by this time, everyone at the party was watching. Darla stood motionless. There was no emotion on her face. She glanced at me, turned slowly, and walked back into the house. I watched and said nothing. 
The usual chatter of the guests had turned to muffled mutterings and whispers. In a desperate attempt to break the allure of the moment, I shouted, Does anyone want more ribs? Come and get them. Todd and Terry came over to me. What the hell is going on, Dad? Terry was trying to be discreet. All I could do was shrug. Todd headed into the house and I touched his arm. He fell silent when I shook my head, indicating no. Why don't you guys see if we need more beer or other drinks? As the conversations in the courtyard started to return to normal, I relaxed a bit. After ten minutes, I decided it was time to talk to my wife face to face. I didn't get the chance. Dad, Mom's leaving in the Mustang. Terry pointed to the front of the house. My black Mustang convertible was speeding down the street faster than it should have been. The backyard became quiet again as everyone watched her drive away. Darla usually drove the minivan, but it was parked inside. The Mustang was on hand. There were a lot of unanswered questions, but I guess they would have to wait until my wife got home. After that, things went downhill from there. Darla's sister Peggy brought out the cake, and I made a feeble attempt to look happy. Without Darla, everything seemed to be clouded over. Friends and neighbors were the first to leave. Families lingered a little longer, but eventually there was nothing more to clean or wash. Surprisingly, Darla's sudden departure was not a topic of conversation. Everyone made some effort to avoid any mention of it. I was alone with my two sons, and the house was quiet. They both looked at me, waiting for some sign or explanation. I had nothing to offer. I sat on the couch alone while they went to bed. In the morning, I was still there. Todd and Terry got up early and started the day by returning grills and other supplies to the neighbors. The smell of fresh coffee lifted me off the couch. Darla hadn't returned. Whatever was in that envelope must have been very important. I called her cell phone several times, but it was off. Of course, I stayed up half the night trying to figure out what was going on. The boys finished putting everything back in place and left. It wasn't hard for them to figure out that I wanted to be alone. A long, hot shower helped, but not much. There wasn't much I could do on Sunday. Tomorrow I could see if the police could do anything to help. I didn't know any cops or detectives, but I had a few friends at the courthouse. Hopefully, they would be able to help. We had one credit card and one debit card. The debit card was used for everyday purchases, and the credit card was used for large purchases. We made monthly payments on both cards. If Darla had a problem, she would have to use them. The credit card purchases came into the bank account after a couple days, but charges were usually made after a couple hours. I checked the credit card activity first and found nothing. With the debit card, it was a different story. About two hours after Darla left the house, she bought gasoline at the Pennsylvania-Ohio border. Two hours later, she got some in Illinois, and the last transaction was an ATM in Cedar Rapids where she withdrew $300. I was finishing my third cup of coffee when I realized she wasn't coming back. She wasn't just killing time. She was running away. I loved my wife and didn't want to do anything to hurt her, but I also didn't want to encourage her in anything she did. Even though it was Sunday, I was able to cancel both cards in 10 minutes. About an hour later, I called the police department to report that my Mustang had been stolen. I didn't tell them that my wife had taken it. I explained that there was a bank card in the car and that it had been used in three states heading west. I was embarrassed to lie to the police, but I thought it was the only way to get any attention. It was weak, but they seemed more interested in getting rid of me than asking about the circumstances. I took a quick inventory of the house, and the only things that seemed to be missing were her purse and a small travel bag. I had no idea what she had packed in it. For hours, I debated with myself about what to do with her cell phone. Since I had canceled the cards, I hoped it would make her call home and explain everything. I still didn't have time to eat lunch. Before I knew it, it was dinner time, and my sons brought out a couple pizzas. There was a bunch of food left over from yesterday, but I have to admit that the hot slices were delicious. We finally took the time to talk about what had happened. I told them what I knew, and they offered support. I slept in my bed that night. Darla never called. Todd and Terry worked summers at a local tree trimming company. It was hard work, but they seemed to be up to it, and they liked the macho image that went along with the job. I waved to them from the porch as the jeep moved down the street. Finishing my coffee, I walked back to the empty house, still trying to figure out what was wrong. 
I called work and took a week's vacation. I was getting a little bored with the job, but it paid well. I was delivering gravel from one of the local quarries. It was hot and dirty, but it didn't require much decision making. I just picked up the load, shipped it out, and got my paycheck. Right after Darla started working for Prescott Casualty Company, we attended several company events. They had parties and picnics where I met some of the people she worked with. I just realized that for the past six months or so, we had not attended any more meetings. In fact, she never even mentioned them. They were important to her when she first started at the company, and then all of a sudden they stopped. I'm not very good at remembering people I meet, but Bob and Margie Gilson I remembered. Bob was a carpenter and Margie worked in the same office as Darla. It seemed possible to call the Prescott Company. Margie, this is Brian Connor. Do you have a minute to talk? Hi, Brian. I'm really busy right now. I hope it's not something important. Darla didn't come into work today, did she? No, we didn't really expect her to. Oh, really? Why is that? There was a long pause on the other end of the line. It was obvious that Margie was uncomfortable talking to me. Brian, I don't think I want to discuss any of this with you. I think you should talk to your wife. I'd love to, but I have no idea where she is. Another long pause followed. Brian, I'm sorry, but I have a lot of work to do. I've got to go. Before I could say anything else, she hung up. Suddenly, I had a feeling that something was going on with the Prescott business that Darla didn't want me to know about. That explained why we no longer attended company events. She was afraid that someone would accidentally say or do something that might give her away or make me believe she was up to something bad. I grabbed a cold beer and went out on the porch to think. I had noticed a few things over the past few months, but hadn't given them much thought. Darla had started working overtime a few times a week. Not enough to wave red flags, but it had become a regular occurrence. She stopped talking about work when she was home, and we began to avoid socializing with anyone in the company. On the other hand, she didn't change her appearance or her clothes. She didn't buy any new clothes or fancy underwear. There were no suspicious phone calls or emails as far as I could recall. I trusted my wife, so there was no reason to think twice about what she was doing. At home, she wasn't turning into a bitch or denying me romantic relationships. It was time to make a few more phone calls. Donald Curry was an old high school friend of mine who worked at the courthouse. I didn't know what he did for a living, but I knew he was involved with computers. I explained the problem to him and planned to meet him when he got home from work. Before leaving the house, I called Ronwell Home Builders and learned that Bob Gilson was working on an apartment complex nearby. I planned to meet him right after lunch. I usually finish my Taco Bell burrito, but today I only ate half of it. I couldn't wait to talk to Bob. When I arrived, the construction workers were still on their lunch break. Bob smiled and walked over to the car. He seemed much friendlier than Margie. Brian, it's good to see you. I assume you want to talk about Darla. Bob, I talked to Margie this morning and she refused to tell me what's going on. You need to tell me man to man, no bullshit. I liked Bob because he was as blue collar as I was, but I knew that if he tried to lead me around, I'd be pissed. Brian, I usually don't pay attention to Margie when she starts gossiping about work, but that's all I know. Darla has been dating a married guy at the office for almost six months now. They tried to keep it a secret, but it soon became known to everyone. Margie stopped talking to Darla when she found out, as did many of the other girls. We missed you because of company business, but we figured Darla kept you out on purpose. That's all. I'm sorry there's nothing more I can do for you. Do you know who this guy is? No, I wasn't paying close attention. I can find out for you. Don't worry about it, Bob. I'll take care of it. That pretty much summed up the situation for me. There was no misunderstanding. It was just a stupid husband who had no idea what was going on in his own home. Ten minutes later, I turned off her cell phone. Now she couldn't call home. I was on my way home when I got a call on my cell phone. Cedar Rapids police found the Mustang parked in the bus station parking lot. The car had been towed to the impound lot, and I could pick it up at any time by paying $300. I stopped by the police station and was given a printout of the report. The only conclusion I could draw was that Darla had left the car and taken the bus. I had no way of figuring out where she had gone, but I assumed west. I didn't even know if she knew anyone in the area. 
I went to the bank and closed all joint accounts and opened new ones in my name only. I changed the beneficiary on my insurance policies to boys. I got to court early and drank too much before Donald arrived. Brian, there was a divorce hearing today, and Darla was called to testify. Of course she didn't show up. Marsha Ridgway was divorcing her husband Kelsey on grounds of betrayal. Mrs. Ridgway wanted Darla to testify that she was the woman with whom her husband committed the act. So the divorce didn't go through without Darla's testimony. No, it went through as planned. It seems Mrs. Ridgway had photos, videos, and phone records that backed up her claim. She didn't really need Darla's confession. I think she was served just to embarrass her. It seems to have worked. What's Darla's status now? The best I can say is that no one cares anymore. She has nothing new to report, and it doesn't matter. Kelsey Ridgway more or less came clean after his wife's lawyer presented all the evidence. The judge immediately granted the divorce suit. A final decision will be made in six months. He is accused of embezzling child support. He had children. Three, all under the age of ten. He's going to be paying for that mistake for a long time. Donald and I talked for a while before he asked permission to go home to his family. I thanked him for his help and asked the bartender to bring coffee. I was about to get one of the red pickled eggs from the jar on the bar, but then I remembered the leftovers from the party. I drank a little more than I should have, but I still managed to make it home without killing myself or anyone else. It was a stupid thing to do under the circumstances. I wrapped six ribs in foil and stuck them in the oven while I showered. By the time I got back to the kitchen, all that was left of them was a pile of bones. Todd and Terry came home and immediately got to work on the pork. They jerked my leg around a bit and then pulled a second portion out of the oven. Todd was excited about the Mustang situation. After 20 minutes of discussion, I finally agreed to let both boys take the bus to Cedar Rapids and drive the car home. I gave them $600 to cover the expenses. Terry scribbled a note on the computer, giving them my permission to pick up the car and drive it home. He seemed to know what he was doing, so I kept quiet and signed it. The next morning, we all had breakfast, and I drove them to the bus station. I chuckled slightly as they boarded the bus. They had no idea what two days at Greyhound would be like. It was a great life lesson. I called the Cedar Rapids Police Department to have them wait for them. They promised there would be no problem. There was something else I had to take care of. It didn't take me long to find out where Kelsey Ridgway's office was located. When Margie saw me, she immediately reached for the phone. It was too late. I didn't even bother to introduce myself. I just started pounding on his head and shoulders. He made a few feeble attempts to defend himself, but ended up on the floor behind his desk. I kicked him in the balls a few times before the guards pulled me back. He was covered in blood, and I felt much better. Things went quickly after that. Before I realized what had happened, I was already at the police station, arraigned before a judge, and on my way to the county jail. There was no trial, just the judge and me. I got 60 days, but I didn't care. The first chance I got, I called the boys and brought them up to speed. I could have sworn I heard Terry laughing on the phone. The house might as well have been empty for days. Well, it wasn't exactly like it looks on TV. I mean, it wasn't a walk in the park, but I didn't feel like my life was on the line or that I could be raped at any moment. It was mostly a bunch of nasty farts who didn't know how to get along with others and a bunch of stupid kids. The kids and the farts didn't socialize much. A separate cell was out of the question. I ended up sharing a cell with a 300-pound gorilla named Jocko, who beat his wife when he caught her in bed with his brother. I didn't know what happened to the brother. Jocko and I got along just fine. I, of course, took the top bunk. There were more carbs in the dining room than I liked, and Jocko was more than willing to help me with what I didn't want. Aside from the fact that he farted more than any other man in the state, he was the perfect cellmate. Three days later, Terry and Todd came to visit me. The car hauling trip went great, but they didn't want any bus trips in the near future. They had no information about Kelsey or their mother. They brought me two packs of cigarettes even though I don't smoke. Todd said he thought they might be useful for trading. He's watched too many movies. Joko, however, was beyond thrilled when I gave them to him. He said he needed to smoke to lose weight. I had no problem leaving the boys home alone and apparently no one else did. Todd left for school the week before I got out of jail. He took the minivan and left the Jeep with Terry. 
Terry and I celebrated my homecoming by going to Red Lobster. He was excited to start his last year of high school. Unfortunately, he was going to have to experience it without me. I had other plans. Margie couldn't believe her eyes when I walked by her desk the next morning. I winked at her and headed straight for Kelsey's office again. Three hours later, I was back on the bus heading to the county jail, this time for six months. Terry found this amusing, and he immediately called his brother in College Station. Jocko welcomed me with open arms. Who? I handled Kelsey better this time. I really think I broke something. Of course, I never got any feedback, so I can't know for sure. I got fired from my job. Big surprise. I had enough money stashed away to pay for the house and cover my living expenses. Terry had no problem taking care of everything. Besides Terry, the rest of my family visited me regularly. Terry made sure I always had cigarettes for Jocko. Darla's sisters came to visit me and expressed sympathy. Neither they nor any other family member had heard anything about Darla. In fact, we celebrated Thanksgiving and Christmas in prison as a family. I was still a month away from getting out when I lost Jocko. I didn't really lose him, he was just released before me. His wife and brother had gone to Florida, and he had no idea what he was going to do. Terry thought it would be great to have Jocko stay with him until he got settled. He offered him a job with a tree trimming company, but Jocko decided he'd rather move south where it was warmer. I thought about Florida. The night before Jocko left, Kelsey Ridgeway was found in a downtown alley beaten to a pulp. He told police he'd been attacked by a monkey. I thought it was funny because I had an ironclad alibi. After I was released, I decided I'd had enough of Kelsey. He wasn't really working in the neighborhood anymore, and I didn't feel like looking for him. I signed up for a course to learn how to drive big trailers. It wasn't much more difficult than with the dump trucks I was used to. I had a few months to kill before Terry started school at Auburn, so I spent that time fixing up the house. I wanted to sell it, but it was deeded to both of us and I didn't want the hassle. No one has heard a word from Darla since she left. Terry took the Mustang with him to Alabama because it attracted girls. I was never much into it, but I wasn't as young and handsome as he was. I found a couple who wanted to buy a house with clouds overhead. I wasn't sure what that meant, but they got a good deal on the price. Their lawyer assured them that Darla's signature wasn't needed, and I wasn't going to argue with them. I just wanted to get rid of the whole thing, plain and simple. I used the down payment to buy the trailer. Before I knew it, I was on my way and free. I never bothered to file for divorce from Darla because I didn't see the need to. I wasn't interested in getting married again. You don't meet many interesting women in prison, and Jocko steered me toward an alternative. Turns out Darla wasn't interested in divorcing me either because I didn't get a surprise in the mail. I had no problem finding a job. I wasn't in dire need of money, so I could be a little picky with my orders. I never transported anything frozen, live, toxic, or explosive. I also avoided traveling north of the Mason-Dixon line in the winter. It didn't take me long to learn the ins and outs of the craft, and I really enjoyed my new life. I'm An interesting development occurred when I was delivering a load of farm equipment to South Dakota. It was June, so there was no problem with the weather. I unloaded the load and was heading south about 10 kilometers off Highway 90 when I stopped at the Puzo's Up Diner. It was a hole in the wall, but the parking lot was full of big trailers and cars. The highlight was the all-day breakfast, which was second to none in size and flavor. Most of the diners were local, but there seemed to be a few truck drivers who came here on purpose. I simply asked the waitress to bring my favorite dish and coffee. Three big screen TVs were showing three different programs that no one was really watching. The TV closest to me was showing mostly political ads, and one of them caught my attention. John Hemingway was running for the U.S. House of Representatives. He was good looking and seemed to possess a sharp tongue. Standing off to the side of him, dressed as Jackie Kennedy with a wide smile on her face, was his new wife Darla, my Darla. My musings were interrupted when the largest plate of food I had ever seen was placed in front of me. Here you go, big boy. You need anything else? Tabasco. The hot sauce was hidden behind the pepper shaker. Betsy, my waitress, giggled softly as she moved it from its hidden spot to my plate. Well, is that it now? Almost. Who is that woman standing next to that slick politician? She snorted slightly. It's a new arm candy for Hemingway. He needed a wife so he could run for president. Rumor had it he wasn't straight, if you know what I mean. 
I started pouring Tabasco over the slide of food. She looks too old to be candy. I guess you can't be too picky when you're in a hurry. Still, she's pretty, and I think older women make the best lovers. Don't you agree? She did look good. Her blonde hair was now brown and looked like it had been styled at a fancy beauty parlor. Her makeup was flawless, and the dress fit her perfectly. It wasn't really a dress, more like a tailored suit. I took my eyes off the TV and noticed that my waitress had gone back to work. The food was great, and it was easy to see why the parking lot was full. My coffee cup filled twice before I cleared everything off my plate. The pie looked appetizing, but I had no room left. Betsy took my empty plate and put the check in front of me. Will he win the election? Not if we can help it. He's got big money behind him from powerful people in Sioux Falls. None of the locals want anything to do with him, but we don't have the votes or the money to stop him. I chuckled, pulling out my money clip. You know something, don't you? Are you sure they got married? Yeah. They actually showed it on TV like it was a reality show or something. Really, no honeymoon. They said they would wait until after he took office. I was still smiling as I put the ten on the table. Mister, you better tell me that before you walk out the door. I'm not looking for trouble, and I don't stick my nose where it doesn't belong. However, I'd like to ask you a favor. What's that? Can I get a couple hours of sleep before I hit the highway? No problem, but watch out for those coke whores. They sneak up here from time to time. They're dirty, nasty bitches. I nodded in acknowledgement and, still smiling, headed out the door. Betsy watched from the window as I climbed into the car. I was just beginning to enjoy a well-deserved nap when there was a knock on the door. I ignored it for a few moments, but it didn't stop. Go away. I was told I could park for a couple hours. Whoever it was wouldn't leave, so I had to open the door. Betsy said I need to talk to you. Do you have a few minutes? It was dark and raining. All I could see was a stern-looking woman in a poncho. I didn't break any laws. Leave me alone. Just give me ten minutes. She looked determined. I'm sorry, lady. I'm not interested. Go get someone else. I'm not a prostitute, damn it. I need to talk to you about Hemingway. I'll meet you inside in ten minutes. That seemed to calm her down. There was a slight smile on her face as she closed the door. Perhaps it would be best to just let her get in the car, even though she was soaking wet. Putting on my raincoat, I glanced at the clock. I had only managed to get three hours of sleep. The restaurant was still quite crowded. There was a place next to the door where all the rain gear was stored. In a couple months, it would all turn into winter clothes and boots. She sat in a booth by the window with two cups of coffee in her hands. She had straight, shiny black hair with a small white strand at the side. Judging by her complexion, she was an outdoorsy kind of girl, tanned and not pampered. In fact, she couldn't even close to being a girl. She was at least 35, maybe over 40. The high cheekbones and lack of makeup completed the whole look. Sitting down, I extended my hand to her. Brian, Brian Connors, Sally Wilmot, would you like something to eat? No, thanks. I just had the specialty food three hours ago. I don't think I'll be able to eat for a while, she replied with a polite smile. Betsy said you might know something about Darla Hemingway. I wanted to talk to you before you left. What the hell is so important about Darla Hemingway? My brother Franklin is running against him in the election. Oh, I see. It's a personal matter. Not really. Franklin represents local interests, farmers, ranchers, and Native Americans. Hemingway cares about Sioux Falls businessmen. We're not anti-business, but we feel like a lot of people won't be thrilled if Hemingway gets elected. Well, I still don't understand what his wife has to do with any of this. We don't know either. All we know is that something is wrong. Our election committee tried to run a background check on her, but ended up with nothing. His campaign staff won't release any information about her. Maybe it's all nonsense, but we were getting desperate, and Betsy said she thought you might know something. I guess I'd better not become a professional poker player if the waitress can figure me out so easily. She leaned back in her chair. Aha. Uh -huh. She was right. You do know something. Are you going to tell me, or am I going to have to shake it out of you? I finished my coffee and smiled. I found her words amusing. 
In fact, it was really funny. I waved my empty cup in Betsy's direction and leaned forward. I think I like the second option better. I have no idea what made me say that. It wasn't in my nature to be clever or use innuendo. I guess it was because I liked her demeanor. She was confident and straightforward. I got the impression that she always knew what she wanted and knew how to get it. Betsy finished pouring, and Sally Wilmot stared at me intently. I'm sorry. It was rude and impolite of me to say that. I'll answer any questions you might have. Sally covered her mouth with her hand and laughed softly. It's all right, Mr. Connors. I'm not that impressionable, and your answer seemed nice. I shouldn't have asked the question that way. Oh, good. That means option two still stands. Hell no. How do you know Darla Hemingway? She's my wife. We've been married over 20 years and never divorced. I haven't seen her in years, but unless she's divorced somewhere I don't know about, we're still married. Sally seemed unable to find the words. She didn't say anything at all. She just sat there looking at me. What name did she give as her maiden name when she got married? She stammered for a few seconds before she spoke. Oh my goodness, her maiden name was Connors. The bitch didn't even try to hide it. Yay! Sure enough, Betsy ran up to me and all the heads in the audience turned in our direction. I was a little embarrassed by all this attention, but Sally seemed pleased. Sally jumped up and kissed Betsy right on the lips. She crossed the foyer and pulled out her cell phone. Betsy blushed slightly and leaned toward me. What the hell did you say to her? I hadn't seen her this flustered in five years. That sneaky ass that had been hiding inside me for years was starting to show. I looked at Betsy and said, I told her that you were my love and that I was going to get married. She immediately realized it was a joke and slapped me on the arm as a reward. Are you going to tell me? No, let Sally tell you. I'm going to go back to my car and see if I can get back to work. It was nice to meet you, Betsy. The rain stopped, but I never made it to the trailer. Sally grabbed my hand when I was halfway there. You can't leave yet. You have to talk to Franklin. It won't take long. Just a few minutes. I'd really like to stop all this. Now I'm sorry for what I said to you. How long will it take him to get here? He'll meet us at my house. Do you want to come with me? Or are you going to follow me in your truck? I'll follow you. I felt better not having to depend on someone else's transportation. The Jeep van Sally was driving was at least 10 years old and probably more. After driving three kilometers on gravel, we found ourselves on a worn gravel road leading to an equally worn house. Someone was there because the place was well lit. There was no lawn, just gravel, and not much of it. I tried to stay off the dirt, but it was difficult. There were no other cars nearby, so I assumed Franklin was still on the road. Just outside the door was a storage area for outerwear and boots. It seemed like a good idea, especially because there were already a lot of outerwear and boots in there. It was an interesting layout, mostly because it looked more like a classroom than a living room. Instead of nightstands, there were desks. Instead of desk lamps, there were computers, and there were three teenagers looking right at me. Hey guys, this is Brian. He's here to help Uncle Franklin. Sally walked into the kitchen and started making coffee. I nodded slightly to my listeners instead of saying hello. I felt a little awkward under the circumstances. I looked around the room but saw nothing to indicate the presence of Mr. Wilmot. Since I had two sons, it was easy for me to determine that the boys were about the same age. I assumed they were 16, 17, and 18. There was no television or music in the room. All three seemed to be either working on the computer or reading a book. The strange thing was that they didn't seem to be smart or nerdy, but seemed like normal, sturdy, and active kids. Brian, these are my sons. The oldest is named Tracy, the next is Tyler, and the youngest is Tanner. They each took turns smiling and nodding at me. I couldn't keep from smiling, and my amusement was evident. I realized it was a little weird that we gave them names that all started with a T. No, no, it's not something that amuses me. It's just that I have two sons named Todd and Terry. I thought it was a hell of a coincidence. Tyler spoke first of the boys. Where are your sons? For that question, his mother threw him a stern look, which he seemed to ignore. Todd is at the University of Texas and Terry is at Auburn University. That simple statement lit up the entire room. Suddenly, Tracy came to life as if he had been stunned by an Energizer bunny. 
I'm leaving for College Station in August. How long has he been there? What is he studying? Sally finally touched his shoulder. Slow down, boy, slow down. I'm sure Mr. Connors will have time to answer all your questions. As it turned out, Tracy had a full soccer scholarship and was already enrolled in college. Tyler had been accepted to the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis and was graduating in a year. Sally's husband was in the National Guard and had died in the Persian Gulf five years ago. She wouldn't go into details, and I didn't push. Tanner, the youngest of the boys, hadn't yet decided what he wanted to do, but his mother still made sure he was doing his books regularly. I had no idea what had delayed Franklin, but for the next hour I was busy talking to Sally's sons about everything in the world. Sally just stood back and watched me interact with them, just as I was interacting with my own. After spending time with Sally's children, I realized how much I missed my boys. Finally, Franklin Honeycutt arrived with two assistants. After introductions, Sally got the boys back to work while the adults gathered around the kitchen table. Apparently, they had some doubts about my claiming to be Darla's husband, and it wasn't important enough for me to get into an argument about it. As I got up to leave, I thanked Sally for the coffee and told the boys that it had been nice to meet them. Sally wanted no part of it. Damn it, Brian, sit down. The others at the table sat in silence. Sally took over the conversation like she was running for president. Brian, do you have a marriage license or something to prove you're married to Darla Hemingway? It only took me a few seconds to pull a wedding photo out of my wallet. She was older now and had different hair, but you could still recognize Darla in it. I looked at one of Franklin's assistants who was sitting with a laptop in front of him. Go to the archives in Berks County, Pennsylvania. You should be able to log marriages from 1960 through 1990. Just type my name into the search engine, Brian William Connors. Sally brought me a cup of fresh coffee and smiled slightly. She seemed glad I hadn't left. Assistant number one turned the laptop screen toward Franklin. August 17th, 1979, right? Franklin seemed to cheer up a little. I nodded and sipped my fresh beer. I wish you luck in finding any evidence of the divorce. As far as I know or anyone else knows, I am still married. Feel free to investigate this matter as long as you like. It doesn't matter to me. The conversation started to get a little redundant and boring. This time, no one stopped me when I stood up. Do you mind if I stop for a few minutes in your driveway before I leave? No, not at all. Sally walked me to the door. I looked back to say goodbye to Franklin and his cronies, but they were deeply absorbed in what the politicians were doing. Each of the boys gave me a slight wave or nod as I left. An hour later, I heard Franklin and his group leaving. I thought I was finally ready for bed when I heard the knock on the door again. Sally jumped into the cabin right in her flannel nightgown. She put her finger to her lips, showing me she didn't want me to talk. We were far enough away from the house that the boys couldn't hear anything. But I guess she just didn't want to talk. She spent at least an hour with me in the sleeping car. It was passionate and loving, but a little uncomfortable. The sleepers on the trailer are comfortable for sleeping, but not much more than that. I did the best I could under the circumstances. She left as quietly as she had come. Not a word was spoken. The sun had already risen when there was another knock at the door. It was Tanner calling me to come into the house for breakfast. Fortunately, boys and men like the same food, and Sally knew how to make it. I spent another hour chatting with the boys and felt quite comfortable. So much so that I asked Sally for permission to take a warm shower before leaving. An hour later, I was finally on my way, but not for long. The local sheriff pulled me over before I got on the highway. Apparently, Mr. Honeycutt needed to talk to me some more. I followed the police car back to the belly where Franklin was waiting for me. He was having breakfast and invited me to join him. Betsy brought me coffee and took the opportunity to wink at me. She and Sally must have been closer friends than I thought. It seemed Franklin's legal advisors wanted me to stay. I used the old corny phrase, time is money, to talk him out of it. But he just laughed and continued eating. Now, it would have been very easy to agree to everything and then just run away. But I figured I might want to stay a few more days, especially after last night. The politician paid for the motel room and meals, but that was the best he could do. It was a good opportunity for me to wash my clothes and also pay my bank bills. Wi-Fi is great. 
I sent the guys a couple emails and paid all the bills. I was just taking the second load out of the dryer when Sally walked in. Nah, I don't think I've ever seen a woman who looked better in jeans. She had three children and still had a perfect figure. Her blue Oxford shirt was untucked but cinched with a silver belt. Her skin glistened, but not from sweat, but from a natural glow. She was one hell of an attractive woman. What the hell are you doing, Brian? I shrugged innocently. Folding laundry? You were supposed to be gone by now. Remember when you said you were leaving this morning? Things have changed. Your brother asked me to stay a few more days. The only reason I came to see you last night was because I thought you wouldn't be here today. I can't have you here after- She stammered, searching for words. She didn't seem to be expecting any kind of relationship other than a one-night stand and had no idea how to handle it. I was amused by her disappointment and decided it was an excuse to have a little fun. After talking to Franklin this morning, I am seriously considering buying a house and staying here permanently. He made it sound pretty convincing. Now I recognize bullshit by the smell of it. What's really going on? I sat Sally down on the bench next to the dryers. Your brother insisted that I stay a few more days, just until they set something up to snag Hemingway. I promise to stay away from you and the boys until he's finished. I didn't mean to embarrass you or do anything that might make you feel uncomfortable. That's not the problem, Brian. The boys like you. They wanted to know when you could come again. They were a little upset when I told them you were leaving. Tyler wanted me to talk to you about staying here a little longer. Uh, I'm sorry, I was just trying to be friendly. They reminded me of my family, and it was easy for me to talk to them. I didn't mean to cause you any trouble. Of course, I didn't make it easy when I walked up to your truck last night. You certainly made it harder. For that hint, I got a poke in the shoulder and a smile. Why did you come to see me? Sally shrugged and looked a little embarrassed. I'm not sure. It's been five years since my husband died. Five years without any comfort or passion. It just seemed like the perfect opportunity, especially since you were supposed to leave today. She was starting to get annoyed with me again. Why the hell didn't you leave? I picked up the stack of folded laundry, handed it to her, and then took the rest before heading back to my motel room. She hesitated in the doorway for a moment before I put my finger to my mouth like she'd done last night. Her shy smile was followed by a wide grin as she closed the door behind her. It's much easier to make love to a woman in a normal bed. What I liked best, however, was the shower. Even running out of hot water didn't stop us. Before she left, she made me promise to be at her house for dinner at six o'clock. How could I refuse? I was ready. Heck, I'd already showered twice today. Dinners at Sally's had become a regular occurrence, and Betsy had become my best ally. Betsy and Sally had been friends since childhood. Betsy took great pleasure in telling me about the things they did when they were little and the boys they led around. The conversations about Sally's husband were sad and far from lighthearted, but they gave me a good idea of who Sally was and why I wanted to get to know her better. It was never my intention to stay in South Dakota, but the longer I was here, the more I wanted to stay. By the end of the first week, all the boys had Texas A and M t-shirts and Auburn sports jerseys. Sally kept one of the Auburn jerseys for herself. It was still a little big for Tanner. I didn't pay much attention to the political squabbles. Franklin and his team seemed to be doing just fine without me. Anyway, the press found out about Darla's dark past and began to stir it up. Hemingway's people tried unsuccessfully to ignore it. The more they denied it or ignored it, the worse it got. His popularity began to plummet. I never interfered in any of his affairs until one early morning, unexpectedly, someone came to my motel. The woman standing at my door was tall, blonde, and straight as a pole. I was still in just my underwear, but I invited her in anyway. She avoided my gaze as I pulled my jeans on, but I watched her every move. She was wearing a dark suit with a white shirt and black low-heeled shoes. Definitely, she was a professional at her job. I felt like taking a leak and getting a cup of coffee, but instead, I forced myself to sit down at the small table that comes standard in every American motel room. My name is Mary Beth Steinmetz. I'm an attorney with Levitz Brothers in Sioux Falls. 
I believe you're Brian William Connors. She knew my middle name. That wasn't good. If you'll excuse me for a moment. I got up and made my way to the bathroom. Although I closed the door, I was sure the noise I made when the water hit the toilet bowl had been noticed. I was going to wait a little while, but I felt this pompous bitch needed a little humiliation. In less than a minute, I was back at the table. Was that necessary? No, but I could tell by your tone that we were going to be here for a while. I'm sorry, but I was just trying to be professional. You missed. What the hell do you want? Our firm represents John Hemingway. We recently learned that your marriage to Darla Connors was never properly dissolved, and we were hoping to rectify the problem. How? There are laws in the state that allow marriages to be dissolved quickly under certain circumstances. We believe we can take advantage of those laws with your assistance. Are you telling me to divorce my wife? Yes. Why would I do that? My guest seemed puzzled. I don't think she expected such an answer. At this point, I would be happy with a divorce, but on my terms, and I didn't want her to know that. Miss Steinmetz just sat there looking at me. Miss Steinmetz, could you please tell me in plain language why my wife and I are no longer living together? Don't sugarcoat it and be completely honest. If you can do that, I'll consider continuing our conversation. She leaned back and undid the top button of her blouse. Three years ago, your wife had an affair with a co-worker. When you found out about it, she ran away because she couldn't face you and her sons anymore. She hasn't spoken to either of you since. Is that clear enough for you? That's good. In fact, you're right on the mark. So what's the problem? If you've been following the news, you know that Darla and Mr. Hemingway are in a bit of a bind. We can't undo what's been done, but we're hoping to make things a little easier. By getting her a quickie divorce? That's right. And tell me again, what do I get out of this? Freedom. Hell, I'm happy with the way things are now. You're gonna have to show me how my life can be better than it was before. What do you want, Mr. Connors? You want money? How much? Give me something to work with. What terms of divorce are you offering? There aren't any. That's why it can be done so quickly. No money changes hands, no property to divide, and no custody issues. You both walk away with what you have, and neither of you owe the other anything. Everything is clean and final. How long will it take? Less than 90 days. N does that mean a decision will be made before the election? Yes, I think it does. She admitted it, but she didn't want to play along. Do I have to see my wife? No, in fact, we'd rather you didn't. Do I have to stay here until this is over? That question elicited a sigh from my guest. Uh, yes. Good. I will agree to this on one condition. You must pay for my room and board until everything is finalized. A smile suddenly appeared on Mary Beth Steinmetz's face. I could tell it was better than she expected. I could probably shell out a little more money for her, but right now, just getting my freedom would be nice. I can prepare the paperwork and send it to you for your signature this afternoon. Is that okay with you? That's fine. I need to consult with my lawyer, but I don't think there'll be a problem. I didn't have a lawyer, but I wanted to consult Franklin first. Your lawyer? Give me your card. I promise to call you if he doesn't like anything. If you don't get a call, bring me the papers. I was glad it was over because I had to get breakfast. I walked her to the door, barefoot, wearing jeans and no shirt. As she was pulling away, I saw Sally on the other side of the parking lot. Before I could wave at her, she sped off down the road. After a quick shave, I got dressed and headed to the belly. Betsy, serving me my coffee, gave me a stern look. Do I get a chance to explain everything? Not to me, Mr. Connors. You'd better come up with a good story for Sally. Breakfast was hot, but the company was cold. I finished it as fast as I could and called Franklin. He was out of town, but we talked for about 20 minutes. He was thrilled with the whole situation and advised me to keep it up, but to make sure I had copies of all the paperwork. He sounded like he was in control of the situation regardless of how it developed. I asked him to call Sally on my behalf. He was still laughing when he hung up. There was a large power wash next to Interstate 90. I spent at least an hour steaming and vacuuming the car and then hand waxed it. That took another hour to do. It would have been easier to just pay and have it done, but I needed therapy. 
Before returning, I grabbed a bite to eat at Cracker Barrel. I managed to avoid Betsy's wrath. This time, she parked right outside my room door. Sally got out of the Jeep when I pulled up and looked a little embarrassed. It was easy to tell from the look on her face that Franklin had called her. She spent the next two hours apologizing to me. Sometimes guilt is useful. When she left, Miss Steinmetz returned with papers for me to sign. For some reason, she also made me accept a check for $10,000. Hemingway's campaign continued to go under, but my divorce petition made it through the legal system. Tracy was now living in College Station and had a girlfriend who was looking out for him. I was officially divorced just before the election. Franklin won and promised to repay me for my help. I didn't feel I had done anything wrong, but I told him I would refuse to do it even if he gave me his sister. For that, Sally gave me another slap on the arm. Things weren't going well for Darla. After the election, someone decided to accuse her of bigamy anyway. Before they could do anything about it, she just disappeared. She was good at it. I never got to see her or talk to her. I sold the truck and bought a house with a small gravel pit near Huron. Sally and I were married at Christmas and all my five sons were there. Betsy moved to Double Wide and promised to take good care of him. The ultrasound showed we are having a girl. Does anyone know any good girl names that start with the letter T, 